Claire. I'm here in Belfast, Northern Ireland with Owen Denver. Hello. We're gonna take a walk around town and check out the local music scene. So we are at the Sunflower Bar in Belfast. It's a big uh, live venue here. They're a big supporter of the arts and they have a lot of uh, resident bands, they have trad bands, they have uh, lots of people do their single launches, EP launches upstairs in the room that they hire out. Um, but it's a great bar for music and beer and pizza. <laughs> so how long have you been playing in Belfast? Um, I grew up in Belfast, but then I moved to Edinburgh um, probably about seven years ago, maybe. Was that was for there. school? Or? No, that was, I took up a job in oh, nice. uh, doing IT stuff oh. and it wasn't for me. I uh, always talked to my friends about how I did music and eventually they were like, right, you just keep talking about it, how about you just do it? Yeah. And then they like signed me up to gigs during the Edinburgh Fringe. That's and so cool. That was kind of how I ended up being more public about music. Mm -hmm. So when I moved back to Belfast again, it was more like, right, I'm gonna do this properly now. Before that, I was just a bedroom musician. Yeah. I'd studied um, like recording techniques and stuff and had written like hundreds of songs. Mm -hmm. So I'd written and recorded like my first sort of album, but it was a very sort of like rough and ready, like bedroom album. Yeah. And then that was what I went away to Edinburgh with. And then more recently, since I've come back, I've learned a lot more about I do not make stuff sound rubbish. I guess you want to feel that way as opposed to like, I haven't gotten better since my first <laughs> thing that I ever made. Yeah, well, sometimes you just have to vent all that angst. Yes, and that too. <laughs> yeah, it's only cringeworthy, yeah, in the future. So how long were you in Edinburgh before you came back? I spent two years there, mm -hmm. roughly. Um, it was kind of the minimum of what I had to stay for the job. Sure. So it was kind of my time that I had to spend there, really. Yeah. And. Uh, I really love the city, it's really class. Um, I'm actually just back from Lisbon there at the weekend and it's actually like kind of similar where it's like really hilly and really sort of like, I don't know, all these nice old buildings. Yeah. And it's just like a different, completely different style of city. Yeah. It's a lot more classical and um, so yeah, Edinburgh I still love. I go back there occasionally every, every once in yeah. a while. And you have friends, friends there. Friends there yeah. And there's venues that I like to play there. Mm. So. Um, yeah, it's a real like home from home. What are some of your favorite venues to play here in Belfast? More recently, I've been more kind of uh, nestled up into my home studio and mm -hmm. been recording a lot. And it's yeah. not been not been until quite recently that I have been actually out gigging again somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I had a an EP launch there at the American Bar, mm -hmm. um, the start of the month, and. Uh, that was really great. It's also it's the same owner as the Sunflower Bar, mm -hmm. um, Pedro, um, and he's just he's such a legend. That playing in his bars are like, yeah, they're yeah. always really satisfying. They're always really fun, and they're always very accommodating. Mm -hmm. um, the last gig I played in Belfast before that was a venue called the Black Box, which is great. It's kind of a big prestigious venue. A lot of, um, sort of big names will play there, but. Um, one of the reasons for booking there is mainly because it's kind of in the middle of everything, but oh, yeah. uh, it's quite expensive to book, so then it's all the more pressure to get people in the doors, and oh, okay. you kind of don't worry as much about the music as you do about worrying about like how many tickets am I going to sell. Yeah, the business side. Yeah, yeah. whereas um, some other bars will be a lot more accommodating for uh, getting you in for like a reduced rate or whatever. So is that, because it's different in the States, at least where I'm from in New York, so when you book a show, you have to pay the venue and then sell tickets to make it back. Yeah. That's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. There are some exceptions, mm -hmm. um, like the Sunflower and the American Bar. Yeah. Um, so that's why the, they have so much live music here. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people just kind of float in as well. Mm -hmm. People are kind of hankering for live music. That's just where they go. Do crowds sort of know that you can expect different kinds of shows at different venues, or would you say it's a lot of sort of the same kind of vibe? Um, I'd say probably every band is probably played in every venue, oh, okay. no matter what style of band that they are. So they're not genre specific? Not really, no. There's a couple um, that are kind of a bit more 
Halloween-y vibes. That's awesome. That, <laughs> that I'm not sure music, my music would fly that well yeah. in. Um, but like there's a new bar that's opened in town. Uh, I say new bar, mm -hmm. it's just been rebranded and was a very old bar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the Ulster Sports Club. Mm -hmm. And it's a real like, I don't, don't even know how you describe it. It's all like really dated and like disco balls and sort of like tinfoil streamery that's stuff awesome. ever. <laughs> and I think that's pretty much the way that it was designed originally. Yeah. But it had just gotten really outdated and then it was re-bought over. Bought over and just rebranded and they yeah. didn't change anything. But so it's funny. such a cool place to go for a gig because it's just so tacky that it's brilliant. <laughs> it seems like a lot of venues are sort of in the same area, is that right? Um, that's probably a fair enough statement, yeah. You've yeah. got like a uh, cathedral quarter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not that big, maybe like half a mile sort of circumference, I don't yeah. know what the word is, yeah, yeah. but um, that's got maybe like 15 bars in it and cool. even um, for the tourism side of things they'll have, like 90% of them will have music on, mm -hmm. if not Monday to Sunday then at least like Thursday to Sunday. Yeah. So there's a lot of work going for musicians if you're, because really like we owe an awful lot to tourism that's happened in Belfast, like um, the Titanic Museum opening yeah. up and the Titanic Hotel and then like even Game of Thrones being shot here. Right, yeah. Like people come into Belfast and it's just kind of part of the route where yeah. um, people go out for a drink in Cathedral Quarter. Because yeah. there's a lot of really cool bars there as well. Has that so. change happened really recently? Like have you personally seen that, how tourism has changed the city? Um, I don't know if, how aware of it that I am. I know that, um, I was kind of surprised because last time I was in Edinburgh, my, I was staying with my old flatmate and he had this book that was like 1,000 things to see in the world Yeah. and number like 32 or something was the Titanic Museum really? which has only existed for like four or five years That's or something. That's so funny. So can you talk a little bit more about this venue in particular and sort of what people can expect from a gig here? It's a really sort of nice intimate venue. Um, downstairs you'll have a trial band in, I think they have a residency like over the weekends. And then upstairs, um, people threw on their own gigs. I launched um, a few singles upstairs, a couple of EPs upstairs. Nice. And it's just a really nice, intimate venue, bar at the back. And it's just, you kind of have to see it to experience it. Yeah, you yeah. have to come. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody go. <laughs> so here we are at the OEI Music Centre in Belfast. And we're going to go outside. Tell me, does it feel right? Oh, 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 cause I've been thinking that it just might. So the Ooh Yeah Center is great for uh, a lot of stuff. It's a real like creative space for um, artsy people to get together. I actually I started to get involved with the Ooh Yeah Center about three, four years ago, maybe. They have this scheme called um, Scratch My Progress where they take uh, four or five different artists from the city. It will essentially be them kind of at the beginning of their career, at the early stages of it. Mm. And then they put you through, they they put us through an, an awful lot of stuff for free, which was brilliant, which was like recorded a single, and um, which then was made as like a compilation album of uh, everyone that was involved in it. And then we got uh, really class like press photos and um, chats with like accountants and how to deal with like a lot of industry stuff like awesome. how to handle uh, like performing rights and so it's like music boot camp it's just so well set up here that um they have like funding from the arts council here That's and amazing. um they even they have like the live venue here as well so there's they're well set up and even when i first started getting into music there was nowhere that i could really go to hang out with other musicians that yeah. were doing the same thing that i was doing uh, but nowadays they have a thing called volume control, I think it's called, mm -hmm. and it's for people who are, I think, somewhere between the ages of like 12 and 18, mm -hmm. and people go to start bands together That's or so to cool. learn about sound or to learn about organizing gigs. I find that music networking has so much to do with the drinking scene, which is fair, um, but I remember being 16 so frustrated that I couldn't play anywhere because I wasn't old enough to get into a bar. There's an awful lot of stories of artists who started out by, like Laura Marling, I know mm -hmm. she'd been I like turned her. away from gigs before, which she was supposed to be playing, but she wasn't 18 yet. But the OEA Music Centre 
is actually uh, an all-ages bar. It's a cool place to play for like one of your first shows because it's quite a big capacity venue, it's mm -hmm. 300 people. And uh, for the most part, outside of that, you'd maybe be looking more to do like when you're starting out, you want to like 30 to 50 people, right, yeah. like numbered venues. So to play in a cool big venue like here yeah. uh, for a festival is pretty cool. So have you played shows outside of Belfast as well, either around the country or outside of the country? Yeah, so um, I've played the, the odd festival in like Wales and in England, uh, okay. sort of random little things that sort of came about, uh, which have been really fun. And uh, most of the radio play that I actually get is actually from the south of Ireland. Oh, okay. And so I've gigged there a little bit. Have you noticed differences in audiences in different cities you play, or are the reactions you get more or less the same? Um, I don't know if it's just from my own concerts, but generally I find that um, concert goers in Belfast tend to be a little bit older. Oh, interesting. Um, it might just be like the style of music that I'm doing because mm. like I'm sort of doing whatever I can and people will turn up. Yeah. You don't know who's going to turn up. I think what you get in here in Belfast in a lot of bars is you'll have the same songs in every bar that you, that's been sort of played by yeah. like lots of cover music yeah. that's happening there. But in Dublin, when I've been out down there just drinking, yeah. Um, they'll have a band on that aren't doing covers. There'll be like some weird band from the other side of Ireland that just happen to be on a tour and mm. on a Saturday night they're playing to loads of drunk people <laughs> who are still happy enough to sit and listen and yeah. embrace this weird music. Yeah. And so like I've seen some weird stuff in Dublin that it's just it's so much it makes the night so much more memorable as oh, well. Yeah. Because it's not just a case of like right now you're gonna play Mr. Brightside yeah. and then now you're gonna play Brown Eyed Girl. Dublin has a lot going for it where they're a lot more open to just randomly walking into yeah like weird music. I don't know if it is just the culture of like older people here is that they're more likely to go to shows yeah. than younger people. Oh baby, you're a green light. Think about me. Think about you. It's been driving me crazy. So this is the American Bar and uh, a great live music venue owned by the same owner as the Sunflower Bar and um, there was a threat uh, about a year and a half ago maybe where um, because the university in town uh, was expanding they were going to have to knock down some buildings to make uh, student accommodation, make flats and the Sunflower Bar was in the firing line but then there was a massive petition to save the Sunflower Bar but just in case uh, they bought this bar, the owner bought this bar um, as a kind of contingency plan and uh, this one far didn't get knocked down so now he has two bars. So, <laughs> so it's a win-win I think there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they're both great for live music and they are yeah, brilliant for even supporting local artists, a lot of the artwork that you see in the walls and um, some of it is just straight up uh, vinyls from um, local acts and then there's like photographs that a friend of mine took uh, like boxing photography that's uh, up on the walls and uh, for him it was like one of his first like big sales because he's now um, studying in America and it was good for him to put on his visa to say I've sold artwork to these bars yeah. and yeah they're just a really good bar here for like, supporting uh, the arts and yeah. young upcoming talent. That's so. awesome. Can you talk a little bit about your own music, sort of your style and uh, people who have influenced you over the years? Yeah so uh, I've kind of coined the uh, the sentence of like uh, Bonnie Bear meets Bach because I kind of amazing grew up as like an orchestra boy and played started off in violin and I still play viola and mm -hmm. um, I always played in orchestras I never really uh, enjoyed classical music all that much it was never really my thing yeah there's too much like, precision involved in it and um, a lot I, of rules a lot of rules I prefer to be a bit more haphazard and random. Um, so I taught myself guitar and piano. More recently I've got a lot more into writing on piano. I don't know if it's like guitar fatigue or what. But yeah. I play an awful lot of guitar and uh, recently, I, I, well not that long ago, I bought myself a, a nice keyboard just to force myself to learn how to actually play it well. Yeah. And I still feel like a complete fraud on it, <laughs> but the more I do it at a gig, the more comfortable I feel with it. And um, it's just, it's it feels like a fresh take on songwriting yeah. for me now because not just 
It you opens know, some new doors. Yeah. yeah. Plus you want things to sound different and almost every male singer songwriter is them on a guitar. Yeah, and especially here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you still incorporate the viola into your music now? Yeah. Uh, I used to be I'd use it an awful lot during live gigs, so mm -hmm. I'd use a loop pedal and stuff. Um, uh, and yeah, it was good fun doing that, but it's a very different type of sound and it's a lot yeah. more hassle bringing these things on tour with you Yeah. Uh, when you need to bring more instruments. But uh, it's very handy for when you're building up, uh, you're working on a recording and you want to kind of have a nice big orchestral sound. And, yeah. Uh, and I know like lots of string players because I got played in quartets and stuff. Right, yeah. So like my friend Dermot who plays cello, like I play with him an awful lot. And uh, even everyone I met in orchestras when I was growing up, like Ulster Youth Orchestra mm -hmm. and uh, the Belfast Youth Orchestra, like everyone played at least four different instruments because so cool. you wouldn't just stick to the one instrument. Yeah. So like um, this friend I'm really close to, uh, he I met him at one of these like orchestra camps, and he was a percussion player. And then I found out afterwards he was a songwriter and a piano player, and um, everyone just kind of has their own music that they're writing yeah. and. It's, it's really encouraging um, when you see people around you that are making music because then you think, okay, they've done that. They were able to do that from their bedroom. So like, what can I do? And I want to do something that sounds similar, but I'll do it in a different way. Or yeah. basically, how can I rip off my friends? Yeah. <laughs> you were saying before that uh, political climate is a really big theme in, in songwriting here in Northern Ireland. Is that something that plays a role in your music or not so much? It used to when I was younger, mm -hmm. um, when I cared more about it. It's probably not like good that I don't really care much about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just know that when voting comes around, you just don't vote for the baddies. That's, <laughs> That's fair it, enough. <laughs> as far as I go, but as, yeah. yeah, I think if you get too bogged down in thinking about it too much, it has a serious effect on your mental health. Yeah. Some bands do it really well and they are really encouraging. I saw the Wood Burning Savages uh, last week in the Ulster Sports Club and uh, they're just they make a lot of good points in their songs mm -hmm. and it's there's just something I, I suppose like when i'm playing sort of laid back acoustic music it's quite difficult to have a big heavy political message it plays much better when you're a rock band mm -hmm. and you have a message that you can deliver like that yeah but a lot of bands here do pick up on political stuff and uh, for me i kind of worry that like if you do talk about northern Ireland politics in your songs does that mean you couldn't export your music yeah no that's a like, good point yeah. Because it's, you know, so much of, I was saying before, like, in America, we don't learn about the troubles and we don't learn about what's going on or what has been going on and mm -hmm. what is still going on. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. In, in some ways, people are really interested to learn about issues in other parts of the world, but not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard people describe Belfast as being, like, um, sort of comparing it to Berlin, uh, where it's okay. like a post-war city where yeah. lots of kind of arts have come out of it afterwards in the kind of the result of it and I don't know how like like obviously you can't say Belfast would be as incredible as Berlin but <laughs> it's different. I think there is something there's something there about yeah. that um, because for a lot of people they're well for some people in Belfast or Northern Ireland they might be still stuck in this sort of headspace of thinking like yeah. it's us v them yeah um, but for the most part like you never hear about it yeah, for the most part, I try to avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing us around town. This is a super fun day, and I hope you all enjoyed learning a little bit more about the Belfast music scene. I'm going to link all of Owen's music down below so you can check out his new EP and everything else. And uh, make sure you subscribe because we got new interviews coming really soon. All right, thanks for watching. And I forgot what I was supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> My brain just turned off. Always. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <That's too early. laughs> so this is the Oya Music Center in Belfast. I don't know why I'm using my hands. It's right there. Welcome. I'm not really sure where I'm going with this. <laughs> that was launching my new EP, which is out now. It'll be linked in the description. <laughs> so this is... Oh, are we going? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. There you go. <laughs> Wait, let me make sure. I just ate my words. Okay, sorry. I'm going again. All right. <laughs> <laughs>